inside. For the table. Lovely dance. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Neil, pick up the fat lab with you here in the mother fluffing house, and one more time we are going deep inside. <laughs> and today's guest, I mean, hey, people might say, you know what? Some of the guys you have on this show, Neil, you're biased as bringing people on who you really like to talk to, who you really like to hang out with. Well, this guy would fall into that category big time. Because not only is he a top bloke, he's also mad into his fishing. Ladies and gents, it's the United States of America's own Jason Merlo. What's that? up, Neil? Thank you, thank you for having me, Neil. Pleasure. Hey. I'm buzzing to have you on the show. Absolutely buzzing. And I, I, the, in the Deep Inside series, one of the things we want to do is try and uh, expose the arm wrestlers around the world, and particularly North American lads, who are on the rise. You know, on the rise. I mean, I, I actually um, did a show last night with Tom Holland, Excellent. which went out today. And um, if I can fill my evenings up with talking to guys like yourself, Jason, it's all good because there's so many exciting prospects. I find out about new guys week in, week out in this game. But it's fair to say you're one of the lads that's been on the sort of the radar for quite a while now. Excellent. You're dropping up at events, right arm, left arm, getting those results. You know the fix show we do, obviously. I've got Paul Lynn coming on there and he's... When before we start recording the show, he'll be like, Jason Merlo, mate, dude's got a top role. He's he's all he's all about telling me. <laughs> so it's really just to cast some light on you, Jason. To sort of let people know who you are, where you're from, where you came from in this game, because um you've sort of exploded onto the scene and you're one of the men most likely. So that's where we wanted to start, really, mate. Just just tell obviously you you're based around the New York area, yeah? That's correct, yeah. Um I Originally grew up in Staten Island, New York, uh, and then recently moved out to New Jersey. A um, mm-hmm. little more affordable, and uh, uh, everything worked out that way. So, yeah, I'm in that area. And, and sort of your background uh, in, let's start with sports, first of all, mate, because you look like, from, from watching you compete, you look like you're a very athletic guy. You've got yeah. this sort of long, lean muscle mass on there. So I wanted to get sort of a, a feel for what your – Sporting background, were you the guy that came from fighting or you the guy that came from CrossFit, from powerlifting? From what was your background, bud? Definitely not fighting. I don't think I've taken a punch to the face ever in my life. Always good. Um, yeah, that is good. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, I mean, sportsman like, uh, fishing was one of the first things, but growing up, uh, you know, kindergarten, first grade, I was actually a basketball guy okay. and I did that throughout my entire elementary school up into high school. Um, mm-hmm. I was actually an MVP from third grade moving forward every single year. Um, and that was my, like, that was my everything, my absolute okay. everything besides fishing as a young, young kid. Um, I just really enjoyed the competition of it. And, uh, yeah, that, that is where I immersed myself and that's where my athletic background, so to speak, started from. Okay. So what about the, the sort of rest of the family, mate? I'm keen to understand where the, what the the strength thing came from were you always interested in strength sports or i didn't start to it yeah i didn't really start focusing on strength until i guess sophomore in high school um so when i was a freshman that's when i actually made the decision to stop playing basketball um and the reason was is because it was a full-time job um one of the high schools on the island um it was seven days a week three hours a day and Mm. i would i would i would with one hour of study hall and I was pretty much a straight A student. So Mm. with that um, uh, requirement to go into study hall, that, that also took more time away from, you know, family and everything. So I would get out of school like two or three o'clock, have to go right back to school around six o'clock. And then I wouldn't get home until around 10, 30, 11. Um, And that included that one hour of study hall, which I didn't need. Um, And like I said, that's when I made the decision, like, all right, after this freshman year, I'm uh, I'm giving up basketball, my dream to be a ball player, and uh, I'm going to focus on my studies and just stick with that. So to replace that, um, I started lifting weights, and that was like sophomore year. 
Um, but yeah, prior to that, I didn't, nothing really strength wise. I mean, you know, I was always a physical person. I liked working with my hands, working with my dad, working on, you know, small projects at the home, you know, building mm-hmm. up a shed, fixing things, you know, just physical little labor type of stuff. So I, yeah, I like guess that's really labor. Right. And I guess that's really where, you know, <laughs> working with my hands and, and the physical aspect of me started to emerge. Now, obviously, we're gonna we're gonna sort of touch on the fishing thing a little bit. And you you you've obviously got a close relationship with your dad, and you've come that route sort of through the father son progression. There, he was into fishing, you're into fishing. Did yes. it go back generations as well? Was your your granddad into fishing and so on and so on? Yes, it definitely started with my grandfather. So my grandfather was uh uh he was the one that really introduced it to my father. My father got first introduced to fishing, I think, five years old, um, and then that, that pretty much took off ever since then for him. Um, and he was more of a beach fisherman. Um, that's how he grew up because they didn't have a boat. So they were beach fishermen. Um, he went to the Navy, kept fishing around the world and stuff like that, wherever he stopped. Um, and then when I came around, um, I was introduced to it at two years old. And, uh, ever since then, like pretty much before I could really state a full sentence, I was more literate fishing than I was speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> so you've literally been doing it since you were a baby. Exactly. And the thing that I tell people is, you know, say you're in your construction guy, say you're like 45 years old and, you know, you're one of those project managers that are like, oh, I have 25 years experience in the construction field. I'm only 29 years old. And the waters that I've been fishing have been since I was two years old. So I had 27 years of experience at 29 years old. Like I take that, I take so much pride in that having that experience at this age. Yeah, I, can I love imagine. it. I mean, it, 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 the world's your oyster in that respect. I suppose you could even be a fishing guide or something <laughs> like that when you with that much knowledge and that much time on the water. I've um I've considered that, and I, I and I'm constantly going back considering that. So there's a lot of charter boat businesses over here. Um, it's very popular. Um, I could definitely do it. There's no question about it. What I'm afraid of is it takes away from my personal enjoyment of fishing. Obviously, I like to see people catch fish, um, but I I, I want to catch the fish. Like I, I, I want me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, under, I understand exactly me. So I, I I worry about that, and that that has been one of the reasons why I've been so hesitant on it. Um, but it is always definitely an option that I can do at the drop of a hat. I mean, it's funny that, isn't it? They always say that if you ever find a a way to make a living doing something that you truly love, that you never work a day in your life. And I consider that a great deal myself, Jason. Yeah. You know, I always fancied myself as as a porn star. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? I mean, you said earlier on, you know, it's a lot of effort. But I figure if I was a porn star, I'd be, you know, I'd be first in, last to leave. Yeah. Anyway. Excellent, so Neil. Onto that, but I've, yeah, I'd be up for it. I've even got a name. Kneel down. Oh my god. Hey. Oh my okay. god. Uh, let me thought through some. Make it move. Hey, you've yeah. definitely thought this out, huh, Neil? Yeah, oh god, yeah, I'd be alright for it. You know, obviously being ugly and having a tiny penis might work against me, but I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, don't listen to the missus. I'd be up for it. And it's all about commitment, mate. Live the dream. There you go. Now, <laughs> The fishing thing, you often profess that catching big fish is good for home wrestling. And before we come off that, I wanted to get a bit of a, you know, are you, are you, when you get out there, are you holding the rods sort of in the top row? And... Look, I think just from my experience and going through it forever, I'm naturally wanting to pull in this direction. I want to pull this way from fishing and mm-hmm. When I first joined my team, Team Beast Mode, and have Marcio there and guys like that, um, you know, they swear that my hand and wrist, it has to come from fishing. That's that, like, they, they have no other explanation for it. And, um, yeah, they swear by it. They swear that it has to stem from that. You know, just the dexterity, dexterity and coordination of, you know, fishing, holding a rod, twitching the bait, doing whatever you gotta do. Like that is probably partly why I, was able to develop a hand and wrist. And from it, like you said, you haven't done that from a very young age. There's probably something in it, mate, because now when you're a fully grown man, obviously a rod's not, the circumference of the rod is not going to be too significant. Of course. 
But, you know, when you're a kid, you're reaching around a, an adult rod, which you're going to need a, a pretty decent sized rod to fish for some of the species that are out there. Exactly. When your hand's small, it's pretty taxing. Yeah. It's going to be, and if you've been doing it, doing it forever, uh, I, I rode motorcycles as a kid, race motorbikes and uh, motocross bikes and so on. You get tremendous pump in your forearms. And I always, I think there's a correlation there. Yeah. I'm sure I attribute some of the forearm, hand and wrist strength to, to hanging onto a motocross bike when it tries to throw you off, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, like, just at me at a young age, like, I want to do everything. So even when I was, like, five or six years old, like, I'm like, Dad, I want to pull up the anchor. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like like all of that stuff. And that's, like, typical stuff that I could see that could add to um, the physicality behind it. So, yeah, so there's there's a lot of stuff out there. And, I mean... There's even guys out there like uh, the Bunker guys. So Bunker, that's the bait fish that is mostly used in this area. Mm -hmm. um, they do that for a living. And, I mean, these guys get 1,000 to 2,000 pieces of Bunker a day, and they do this for a li living, and they net them and haul them over the side of the boat. Like, those guys, like, I see potential in those guys being like, these guys are animals. Like, yeah. my back at this age, 29 years old, I wouldn't even be able to do that. There's no way. <laughs> so there's certain correlations that, it's, you know, it's all it's it's all fun to think about at first. But when you really start to think more and more into it, I mean, there's it, there's stuff there that probably definitely attributed to, like I said, my hand and wrist. And what better what better uh, enjoyable way of getting out there and training your hand and wrist than hanging on to a bloody big fish? Of course. Absolutely. absolutely nothing better. I'll, nothing I'll tell better. you a funny story, mate. I went out to uh, before we, we get back on track. But. um before the finals for the World Arm Wrestling League in Atlanta, on the way out there a couple of years ago, I uh, I went on a trip fishing for white sturgeon in Canada on my way over in British Columbia. And I, I, I was going to do five days there. Um, and at the time, I was posting it on Facebook. So I was like, this is what I'm doing, you know, and I'm, I'm over there. And when I, when I first land, I've been, since I was a child, I wanted to go over there and fish for, for white sturgeon. I was keen to get something over nine foot if I could, and I was lucky enough to do that. But I was get, I, we had a bumper week. We caught like a hundred fish in the week, and probably hooked 130. We lost, 30, you know, some unbelievable Unreal. fish. But when I first said to the guy, when we got over there, the guide from Blue Water Rockies who took us out there, Chris and Sasha, they said, oh, who's fishing? I said, oh, just me. My dad's here, but he doesn't really fish. He's just going to watch. Right. And they're like, you're going you're gonna, to, do five days on your own. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, ah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> because I, like, I've gone for it because it, you could, you could book, uh, options on the trip. And right. he said you can do like five hours, eight hours or 10 hours. I've gone 10 hours. I'm doing 10 hours. You know, <laughs> I, I will stay out there day and night, mate. If I could. Oh yeah. I'm like, no problem. I'll just, don't worry. I won't get bored. I won't get tired. It's on. And he's like, yeah. You, have you ever caught a uh, sturgeon before? I'm like, no. <laughs> And he's like, oh, yeah, you're going to be <laughs> the second day. You know, like when you've weight trained hard on that second day when you wake oh. up, and everything's like, oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. Because my technique wasn't on point and everything was a little different. You know, I've not caught fish that powerful before. Right. And, um, oh, mate, at the back end of the trip, I was utterly ruined. My spine was in knots. I loved every frigging minute of it, mate. And I was get you out there doing that. I'll tell you what. Oh, mate, yeah. Geez. Bucket list stuff, mate. Bucket that list looked, stuff. That looked awesome, me looking at those videos like, uh, oh, my God. And like you said, you, your excitement just for when they're coming out of the water like that. Like, I'm like that. I'm, I'm sitting here watching it on my computer, and I'm just like, I'm like shaking because I'm like a kid in a candy store. Like, I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mate, we are going to have to nail that. At some point, we've got to get that book, dude. We really oh do. Oh, my God. That was excellent. Oh, I, I – Definitely for you, definitely a trip of a lifetime. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's like a bucket list thing to do something like that. The, the experience alone and, uh, oh, what a, what a, what a fish to catch. I mean, just, it's a prehistoric creature and just look at the sheer size of them and the power. Like you said, it's, uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. It's a shocking, shocking experience the first time around. But those guys out there that are doing that regularly. You know, the guys that are weekend warriors and they're out there every week doing that. I bet they've got some hand and wrist on them, mate. Because some of those fights are maybe 25, 30 minute non-stop with a thing erratic, dragging oh, yeah. you all over the place. You can't time it. So it's, it's, you got to hang on, you know. Absolutely. It's really Absolutely. good fun. 
Anyway, yeah. we'll get back on to what we came on here to discuss. <laughs> so, now, as you say, you're with Team Beast Mode, you're with some really solid arm wrestlers, but what was yes. your beginning in the sport, mate? How did you sort of come across arm wrestling? Where did, where, where did you come across it? So, one of my father's friends, he's a fisherman that fishes with us as well, um, he actually introduced me to the idea of arm wrestling. He's like, you know, he was just seeing me come up as a as a young kid, you know, he's just like, you know, you have some physicality to you. You're you're taller. You have a longer forearm. You're relatively lean. He's like, I think you kill it at arm wrestling. And like I said, that was when I first started actually weightlifting in the gym and stuff. So each and every year, like starting at like, I don't know, 10 years old, I would arm wrestle him and he would destroy me. Um, and it would really be on my birthday. So I think the first time, I think when I was 16 years old, um, I finally beat him. And like I said, that was really not – looking at anything else arm wrestling, but just hearing it directly through his lens of view. Um, and he's like, you, you got to find, you have to find the tournament. Like you, you got to do something. He's like, I don't know any of the guys from when I pulled back then that he's like, you just got to go on the internet and try and find somebody. Um, so eventually um, a few years later, I think when I turned 20 or 21 was when I saw one of Gene Camp's tournaments uh, in New York um, and that I was like, you know, I had no table experience, no nothing. I would just watch videos on YouTube. Um, mm-hmm. and I would try to apply that. So first time on a table, I went to one of Gene Camp's tournaments. Dan Fortuna was there. Yeah. After the tournament, I went undefeated right handed in the amateur class and Dan came up to me and I, I think I knew a little bit about Dan Fortuna just from videos, but he came up to me. He's like, dude, this is not your first time pulling. And I was like, this is the first time I put my elbow on an arm wrestling table. What are you talking about? He's like, there's no way. I, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Talked a little bit, and then that was that. Um, a few months later, Gene held another tournament. Um, I went back to that. Dan Fortuna was there. Jason Vale was there. Same thing. I said hello to Dan. Went undefeated right hand in the mm-hmm. amateur class. And uh, and Dan was like, I- I'm still not buying it. And Jason Vale was also saying, he's like, let me, let me feel your hand. And he's just mm-hmm. like, dude, you have a solid hand. And I was like, yep, uh, you know, he's like, what do you, who have you been training with? I said, I had nobody. I don't know anybody on Staten Island. I don't know anybody around here. Um, and he's like, dude, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. <laughs> they, were, they were like, yeah, you're no, a- we're not buying it. And I'm like, I just haven't. I watch YouTube videos and I just know nobody else that, that does this. That's close to me. Um, then a few months later, I think I did my final third tournament. Um, and at that point, I think they finally realized that I was telling the truth. Um, and same thing. I went undefeated right-handed that day again. And they were like, all right, no more amateur class for you. You, you have to go pro after this. So I was like, all right, if I'm going to actually do this, now I need to find a team. Mm -hmm. So I think it took me two or three years to actually find team beast mode. That was close enough to me to actually start training with them. So yeah, so that was September of 2015, um, when I was around 24, 25 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when I actually started training on an arm wrestling table. First practice I went to, that was when um, I met Marcio that day. And, uh, yeah, ever since then, got hooked. Marcio but those is, first uh... but those first three tournaments, like I said, I had no table experience whatsoever. I was just able to apply what I would watch from YouTube videos. And, uh, you know, uh, it worked. And was your strength, as you say, natural top rolling? Was that where you... Yes. So I had, like, I would see, like, arm break videos on YouTube. And, and yeah. with my lack of knowledge, just what my initial thought was just seeing people on the inside is where I saw most of the injury videos. Um, and that's why I would focus on staying outside. And, and it just turned out that that was my natural ability to go outside. And I just, I applied that because I thought it was safer in general mm-hmm. to go that direction. Um and yeah, and that's that's what ended up happening. Now, Jason, what, just let's break down your sort of physicality for people who don't know you. How tall are you, mate? I'm six one. So you sit you same height as me, yeah, six foot one. So yeah. Yeah, have you got a particularly long forearm, big hand? Yes. Uh, I mean, my my hand is it, it's not that big. I think it's an eight and a half inch hand from yeah. tip to palm. There. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's a it's a fairly big hand. It's not thick. Um, but um. I'm about, I think, like uh, an inch taller than Marcio's forearm mm-hmm. when we go straight up, straight up yep. like that. Um, so a lot of people had a little bit of discomfort. And they, you know, with the weight class, they said, you know, you have a pretty decent sized forearm for, uh, you know, 
being able to pull this class. Yep. Um, so yeah, that that's that. Yeah. So what six what one. Your most natural weight, mate. If you were sort of like just no diet, walk around where, where you are. Now I'm walking around at 200 pounds. Okay. Prior to this, about a year prior, and everything leading up to that, I was 195. Um, and I would try to gain weight. Um, I have a fast metabolism and I wouldn't really inquire to anybody to find out how to actually gain the weight, but definitely a fast metabolism, super lean. Um, and that's, like I said, my, my comfort weight. I had no prior knowledge to cutting or bulking or any of that stuff. So my focus was just however I am is how I want to. Whatever class I fall into, that's that's it. Like I don't want to focus on trying to hit like a minimum class. I I like eating too much, and I don't want to really like change the diet much or yeah. focus on that. So I was just like, you know, I just naturally fit in my class, and it, it works out well. Do you feel like with having that fast metabolism that for a world class competition that would be something you you would look to do? Maybe hit one eighty sevens um, if that was an easy cut for you. Because it gives you that little bit of a frame advantage. You're a little bigger in the class. Uh, I mean, you know, people have told me to try and open your mind up to it. I, I haven't I haven't really opened up to that mm-hmm. idea yet. Because, like I said, I've, I've never done it. Um, so kind of hesitant to do it. And at the same time, there's there's a little part of me also that I'd, I'd almost rather be the smaller guy in the class and win. I think it makes a lot more of a bigger statement. Um and at the same time, I already know that the majority of people are already cutting down to my class. So at that token, if I'm beating those guys in my class, I'm essentially beating heavier guys. So mm-hmm. I, I just I feel better about myself with those wins. So let's let's focus on when you got to that first club practice. Yeah. Which is so quite I, overwhelming for you. You've got guys like Marcio there, who's a multiple world champion at that point. Yeah, Marcio, Bob Sowick, he's, it was at his house, so he's obviously, uh, uh, around here. He was a lightweight, um, class guy, and, uh, he has, he has some pretty big wins under his belt, and he has a long, long history in the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, Julio Rosario was really the one that got me into it. Um, Julio, uh, at the first tournament that I did as the amateur in New York, um, me and him got matched up with each other. Um, and at that time he was known as like the arm breaker. He was an amateur guy and he had broken like three other people's arms, oh. obviously not on purpose, but that's what ended up happening because he had such a side pressure surge. And, um, yeah. So when I got my wins on Julio, um, I had always remembered him in the back of my mind. And then I, like I said, when I was searching for people to find, I eventually got partnered up with Julio and I was like, mm-hmm. I want to start training. And then, that's how I got introduced into uh, Team Beast Mode at that time. And so, Just yes. Put on record there, Julio Azario, one of the greatest names I've ever come across. <laughs> Never announced that, but I'd love to. Yeah. Oh, Julio did, you see, did you see him against Bill Sinks? Yes. And that, that's yeah. him. So that, that, that's him. He hasn't pulled in a long while um, in a competition setting. He's been battling injuries and stuff like that. And, and he more so has – he has the urge. He likes to see all the guys in the team be successful. He really enjoys the coaching aspect of it and mentoring it. Um, so when I went up to that tournament, like I had nobody else on the team going, so he eventually came, and then he was like, you know what, I, I feel okay today. Let me put my arm on the table. Let me tell you, even though he get, he lost against Bill Sinks, those were unbelievable matches. <laughs> those were unbelievable <laughs> matches to see. You know what? When you're in a match like that, it doesn't necessarily matter if you win or lose. You're friggin' awesome. It, it was, it was so good. And lose and then a flash pin win. Cause you have a great time. Yeah, that's proper, that's arm wrestling to me. Right. That's what right. it is. You know, it, it's the, it's the battle in it. It's the war. It's what I've always loved in it. Exactly. Yeah. And because he hasn't been on the competition scene much, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's people that know him, but he's more so relatively unknown. Um, so when he did that at that, at that tournament, it was like a lot of people opened their eyes up like, holy shit, who's this guy? And, and when he knew he was part of Team Biddy Smoke, he was like, oh my God, there's a lot of strong hand and wrists on this team there. <laughs> Bet your ass, yeah. Who, yeah. who else have you got out there with you then, mate? You've got, you've got obviously a pretty oh, big collective around New York. Did you Solaris part of your crew? No, he is not. Um, I haven't heard much of, from Solaris. I, I've been, 
in as I've been coming up and up, he's been one that I wanted to pull, but he's he's kind of MIA. He's uh he's a bit MIA. I know that he's pulled with uh, the New York guys, you know, Kevin Nelson, Mike Aiello, um, Steve Black, those guys out there. Um, but I think he's been relatively MIA for a bit. Mm. Yeah, Mike's great. Really, really smart arm wrestler. Very good with his hand. Oh yeah, die to win guy. Massive you know. hands. Massive. Yeah, hands. he's got a lot of ability, mate. Uh, that that'll be an interesting match, I think, for you. I think I'd like to see that. He's, he's a guy you've never faced, is it, in competition? I've faced him one time, and he did beat me. Um, he beat me in the strap. Uh, yeah, he had a good setup, and the, that I that was I think my second professional competition that I entered. I think in mm-hmm. two, early 2016. Um, and yeah, he he destroyed me with the straps. He he taught me a lesson. Mate, that's no <laughs> dude, that's not 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 something to be ashamed of at all. Mike's oh. extraordinarily experienced, very high level, and in terms of setting up. Oh yeah. Hard to set up that boy. He's a beast. Oh. He's a beast. Yeah, he wins the warm up. That mother fluffer. There's no doubt oh, yeah. about it. But he's, he's a lot of respect for Mike. He's a very, very good arm wrestler. So, mm. who else you got over there, mate? Who are the other guys that are of note in your team? So, I mean, so there's a lot of relatively unknown guys. Um, this this team was really it, it started before, right before I got there, about a year before. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know. Basically, all new guys coming into the sport and then just building ourselves up on, you know, as a team. Um, there's guys like Mike Pelletier, Ger- Gerald R- Lorino, uh, Pedro Rodriguez. Um, these are guys that, like I said, they're, they're, nobody else has really traveled for the sport. So they're really anybody that just knows them locally. Um, but like I said, I mean, Chris Florendo, Gary Usolino, I mean, these guys are, um, they've been up and coming locally and they're the guys that I would never have been at the level that I'm at now um, without the help of these guys. Like it, mm-hmm. it, it's amazing the importance of finding a team and guys that you can trust um, to help you progress in the sport because you need to, you have to have a desire to get them to progress yep. um, in order for you to progress. Um, so yeah, like these guys Awesome. All the thanks goes out to them because they're they're the they're the only reason why people know a little bit about me. Iron sharpens iron, Jay. Iron sharpens iron, mate. That's and it. Uh, in terms of your sort of standing within the club now, are you sort of the the number two sat below Marcio? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And how often do you get an opportunity to train with Marcio? Because that's a that's a great training partner in many ways. I mean, it took about the ability to work any angle. Good God. Now, of course. Um, yeah, no, whenever Marcio comes out, I mean, he goes in phases where um, when he's really gung ho about training, he's always mm-hmm. there. He's there every week. Um, he's been he recently came back just last week after a little bit of time off because there hasn't mm-hmm. been much going on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's as he's as typically there as just anybody else. Like I said, when when he has his head down training for something, he's he's there every week, you know. Going up to his match with Matt Mask, I mean, he's there every single week and mm-hmm. some. So, uh, so yeah, I get the opportunity to be with Marcio often, and uh, yeah, obviously I'm like a sponge. And what a what a benchmark that'll be. The day comes you can give him a lot of trouble. <laughs> you know you're you know you're knocking on doors then, mate. Let me tell you, my God, because that's a very serious individual. It's everywhere. It's, you know, especially first meeting Marcia, you know, just just seeing how much of a, a, a brick wall he was um, mm. and feeling that. And now, even with my progression, like nothing has changed. It's it's unbelievable thinking the level that he's at. Um, it's it's unbelievable. It really is. It really yeah. is. Yeah, he's a solid dude, mate. He really is. In terms of like your. Your perception of the sport and people that who were your influences when you came in because you seem to me I always categorize people powerhouse technician and for me you are very firmly in that technician camp you look like you it's like you want arm wrestle but look good doing it you know? <laughs> <laughs> kind of that you always look polished you know we got you got guys you see guys around and you you just everything the movements are crisp. Fluid, you're not ragged in any way. Wow. Your timing's on point. You you definitely seem to falls 
into that camp hard. Are you aware of that? Were you sort of, are you following or emulating guys that that pull like that? So the direct correlation there is with the guys I train with. I mean, these guys like Bob Sowick, Julio Rosario. I mean, all these guys, they're, they're definitely on the technician end of the spectrum for arm wrestling. That's how they train. And that's how I was able to really absorb all the data coming Mm -hmm. through. Um, also, like I said, when, when I first started out as well, you know, I was very aware of the injury side of it. And like I said, I, I first, I automatically was most often worried with going inside because I didn't want to risk injury. Um, so I kind of have developed that and that's why parts of my game are lacking. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's really direct correlation because the guys I train with, but just when I was watching all the stuff on YouTube, obviously John Brzezink, Obviously, Devin Larratt, um, and really understanding that um, these guys could beat bigger guys in their mm-hmm. career, um, and understanding the importance of that little detailed stuff. And just in general, I'm a very detail oriented person. Like I see the big picture, but I always hone into the details. Yeah. Um, and I think that is really one of the reasons why I've gone more to the side of technician. And you seem like you're also an extremely calm puller. So that's, and I think that is the only reason for that is one, I like to, I like to stay quiet. Like I'd rather be, I'm not like when I go to a party, I'm not Travis Page announcing who I am. Um, I'm kind of the guy that's more quiet, reserved, you know, I'll pick a few people to talk to and mm-hmm. you know, that's it. I'm, I'm that type of person. So one, by nature, I'm a quiet person. Yep. But two, more importantly, for me, staying calm allows me to think. Um, it, it allows me to think on the table. And, like, if I make a mistake, I'm able to stay calm and analyze what I did wrong. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like, for me, if I were to get all crazy, explosive and stuff like that, like, I would, whatever the plan was, I would just throw it out and, like, let emotions take over. I don't like to... Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to think it out logically step by step and figure out what I'm doing wrong. But however, that is something that Marcio tells me is lacking on my game. He's like, you, you need to start getting more aggressive on the table. Like you need to let that come out a little bit. So we'll see how that starts to develop. But like I said, that's the reason why I'm calm. I like to think and does by, it, does by it, remaining calm allows me to think. Does it come naturally or is it a work? Is it, is it difficult to remain there? Do you find sometimes that you'll go in there and you're nervous or you go in there and you're amped and you're having to sort of <clears throat> calm yourself down, but it's a, an area you feel comfortable being calm? Are you yeah. searching for that? I, 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 it's definitely more natural for me to stay calm. Um, there are times when, you know, obviously blood pressure starts pumping and, uh, you know, you kind of suppress it a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's just, I don't want to lose focus on whatever the plan was. I don't want to lose focus on that. Um, by me staying calm, um, allows me to give me that opportunity to think. Um, and I think that's what really, uh, does it. Um, there's definitely a, there, there, there are times where I do suppress it. Like I said, I, I don't want to change my character. Um, this is naturally how I am. I'm very reserved and very quiet. Um, and I don't want to turn into somebody else. I don't want to morph into some other person. Mm-hmm. This is me. I want to stay natural and, and true to myself. So that's why I also try and keep that persona. Very interesting character, mate, because obviously one of the things that anybody um, that has spent any time around you or seen uh, you on any of the shows that you've been on very frequently of late, I mean, you've really popped up, is that you're uh-huh. an extremely articulate, confident, clearly very intelligent lad. And, Appreciate that. And, and obviously, you can really bloody arm wrestle. Now, I'd like to sort of spend time on the table with you to see that. But in some respects, I've got to disagree with Marcio a little bit on that one. Because mm. for me, you don't seem to be the type of arm wrestler that pulls aggressively off the start from a speed perspective. You seem to pull on the counter. Right. You You seem to be... A little bit of catch and work. I Always agree. In the top role, but very much A side to B rather than A side to win. You don't. You, you always seem here to me every time, here and here. And 
I think there's definitely something to be said for that kind of arm wrestler in terms of being very clear. Right. Very clear and very pure in terms of your thoughts and what you're trying to set up the counter on. Now, Marcio is dynamite. Obviously, yeah. He's at his best when he is blazing through a guy. His biggest <laughs> wins, his most dangerous, for me, his most dangerous moments are that trigger, that hair trigger. He'll just blast through you, and you don't really That's know what hit you. Exactly. Yeah. But for, you appear like you're not that guy, and, and, and as you say, from your character perspective, I'm not sure you could morph into that guy. I right. don't know. I, I agree, you know, because I've seen people morph and change their persona in the sport. And, uh, you know, at, at times it, it, it looks fake, you know, for a little bit of the showmanship. But like I said, there's, there's a, there's a time and place for all those people. That's why there's, you know, uh, villains and heroes and stuff like that. They all have a time and place. Um, like I said, I feel most comfortable at this place. Um, like I said, it just allows me to think. Um, but also a reason probably why you haven't seen you've seen more of the counter stuff is because I haven't been able to develop that speed yet. Bits and pieces of that have been starting to fall into place where I'm able to attack more um, in certain scenarios. Um, and I've been seeing that uh, lately, like my latest win on Brandon Alcester. Um, definitely nothing moved from center of the table, and I was able to essentially take the hand and go at the same time rather than trying to do a catch like – Against a guy like him, I'm able to – my hand, my, what I'm telling my hand to do from my mind, it's able to work and put together. Um, yep. So I've, it, it's slowly been developing, like the speed side of uh, arm wrestling. I, I, I've slowly been grasping it. And there's a very big difference in being fast over an inch, fast over two inches to gain control. Yes. Or fast to the pad. Correct. Yes. You know, and the, the, and – both work depending on the set of tools that you, you you know at your disposal i think that's really critical and if you've got a you know your your natural mindset is that thing it's almost you i sometimes think you're better to go with the flow than try and swim upstream with things like that because it will come naturally to you if you're a sprinter you'll know you're a sprinter if you're a a distance runner you'll know you're a distance runner Absolutely. and often your body's made up that way so do you, yeah. you find yourself sort of Breaking arm wrestlers down now, because obviously you're a student of the game. Obviously, you've immersed yourself in the sport. Um, as soon as we came on the call today, you were talking about current affairs that have happened today. Yeah. You know, um, So you're very much aware of that, and you're very much aware of what's going on. We've seen you on Uncle John's show. We've seen you on Arm TV, on the Dialing show, and various yeah. other things. But most importantly, you've got your own YouTube channel going now. Um, you're obviously immersed in it, mate. So who are your inspirations now? Who are the guys that you look up to emulate who are the people that you sort of model yourself from from a technical perspective yeah so i mean let's see that's a that's a great question um because i do take a lot uh, bits and pieces of everything um and that's something that i always tell new guys in the sport you know you're going to be blasted with so much information you're going to be overwhelmed the key is you need to know what little bits and pieces of information that you have to take from everyone in order for it to not be overwhelming and for it to apply to you and that you can actually use that information. You know, not every, everything that everybody tells you is what you're going to say, uh, as etched in stone for arm wrestling. Um, so I mean, look, I, I, everybody that is above me is somebody that, you know, I've really looked into and, uh, try to take little, it's and bitty pieces from everybody. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody in the elite uh, class, I mean, it, it's everybody. Uh, it, it really is. You know, everybody that's elite at this level, um, there's a reason why there's guys below them, and it's because they have tools and they have um, things that they are able to apply in order to be at that level. Um, so I, at this point, it's really kind of I've I've taken a step back from – let's put in a sense of being like a fanboy and I'm really more focused on just focusing on me and, and really developing. Um, you know, way back when I was definitely, you know, more of the fanboy, like, Oh, look at what this guy can do. Like that would be amazing. If I would be able to just take a little, little bit of that and be able to apply it. And now like I'm at certain levels there where now it's like, I'm just honing in on my craft. 
Um, and like, like you were saying, you know, you, you, you have to be, you have to do what works for you. Um, so at this stage, like I said, I've really just been focusing on me. Um, I watch all, <laughs> I watch all my videos, like, a hundred and fifty times. Like I watch it over and over and over again. And mm. I just really break it down like, all right, this time I'm gonna watch where my hand is, this time I'm gonna watch where I'm breathing, this time I'm gonna watch where my foot positioning is, this time I'm gonna watch where my hips are, this time I'm gonna watch what my opponent is doing, his breathing, his hips, his foot, like everything. I break it down little one step at a time. Um, and that's really where I think I still make the most games. I, I, I watch videos like nonstop mm-hmm. and I watch them over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't really answer your question for who I look up to, but it's like anything that I see in a particular match that I feel like is just a critical piece of information. That's, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. What stands out to me in that? Yeah. Um, and it really stems from a lot of the elite guys. In terms of um, you saying that you had areas of your game which you believe are limited, I'm taking it that you're talking about inside techniques, the press, the hook, things like that. That were you, you are you are you very aware of that in your training, or you're trying yes. to? Okay, that's what I was oh, trying yeah. to get at. Do you, are you are you focused heavily on those and less so on where you feel you've got it dialed? Yeah. So like, <clears> when was it? 2017 when I pulled, I pulled the RVJ in a local event in 2017. Um, he, he obviously had no idea who I was. Um, and we ended up having pretty decent matches back then. Left arm, we had like two 30 second matches where he beat me both. Right arm was a little bit shorter, but he was definitely surprised with my, uh, hand strength. Um, mm-hmm. but he gave me an injury where I had a partially torn UCL. Um, I was trying to slip out of his, clamp of a hand and I felt I felt that tear and that's something that still bothers me today um obviously it's something that I've been rehabbing and trying to focus on for forever um but it's kind of something that's that's definitely still there um so more specifically on my right that is where I've been lacking because of the stuff that I feel with the UCL um so yeah it's it's just been a long process of trying to address it and uh yeah, and trying to build more of that inside game. What's your greatest strength? Is it mental? Is it physical? Can you sort of isolate that? What would you if you sort of break in? You're a video game character, Jason. And you got health bars, strength bars, skill bars. <laughs> Where's the bars? Um, I guess. Uh... Like I said, I'm able to stay calm and focused. I I pride myself on that. Um. And then everything else, it's really the hand and wrist. You know, I think that is the physic, the physical aspect of that is definitely the hand and wrist. Um, I don't think it's easy for anybody to top roll me. I think that's one. Um, like look at, at the, here's a great match and I, this guy's an awesome guy, Seth Barnett. Um, looking up to that match left handed when I was able to beat him 3-0 in 2019, um, I completely took away his hit. Um, he just hit directly into where I have most power and, uh, it didn't end well for a guy like that. So I almost want top rollers to go against me because, uh, I know nine out of 10 times I'm probably going to come out on top. Mm. It was interesting the other week. I think, um, it showed that, that you've got some real venom in, in, in that area of the game when, Paul Lynn, who was ultra impressive that day, he looked rock strong, and I know you commented on it oh on, my on God. our private chats. Yes. But you busted out of his hand, and you could see that he thought, okay, this one's tougher. Yeah. He could, he'd run through people to that point with that same movement, um, and he definitely felt something in that first start. you know. And if you can make a lad who's obviously pulling a little higher level at that day, but he has to adjust his game, of course, that shows you something, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's excellent. It's very humbling seeing that. Um, but yeah, Paul's game is something that, like, especially after that last, uh, ROTN a few months ago, seeing his setup and everything, you know how when Devin told Michael Todd, he was like, Michael told me a le- t- taught me a lesson tonight. Thank you, Michael. Mm-hmm. Like the, the light bulb clicked where I'm like, thank you, Paul, because I know exactly what I need to start training for based on his setup. 
and where he's able to expose me. And I've definitely been attacking that um, ferociously because I see that other people are starting to pick up on that. So I can't let that happen again. Yeah, it's interesting you 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 say that you dissect your game. Uh, I was very big into that myself. That was yeah. something, and those of my opponents, but definitely my game. Particularly if I lost, if I got my ass handed to me, right. um, I always thought it was a good thing to sort of look back at. Okay, what happened there? What did I do wrong? Was it something that I could fix on the day, or was it a inherent issue with what I'm, how I arm wrestle, yeah. and try to sort of um, break that down, isolate it? And then do what you could to eliminate that as a weakness. And it definitely works. And it helps you through opponents as well. So that's really interesting. That exactly. You're doing that route, you know. The whole ride home, I was talking to Julio and I was just like, dude, it clicked. My angles are completely off and how I'm trying to attack Paul's style and, and with his setup. And I'm like, we've got some work to do. I know exactly where I need to address my game. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's awesome when the light bulb just, just clear as day. Um, yeah. so yeah, thank you, Paul. <laughs> hey, how much, um, how much of your preparation is pure table? How much is training these days in terms of weights and supplementing in the gym? Okay. That's a great question. So lately I've been going every other week to practice. And the only reason why is because I'm trying to get some horsepower also to my game. And I think the every other week on the table is good at this point. Um, because it allows me to have one week of some heavy stuff mm. so that I don't have to really space out the time from when I'm recovering from practice and uh, building up to my heavier rep ranges of stuff. Um, so right now I'm around every other week. Um, but that does change. It changes every few months. That'll change. Um, I'll be going to every week to practice. And then at the most, I'll be doing twice a week at practice. So it really changes based on what I'm seeing as lacking in my game, and I adjust it accordingly. What about traveling outside the area, mate? Have you got a lot of aspirations to hunt people, to seek out matches, to go and try and prove it? You oh, know, yes. The cock of the walk was the thing that was coming from. I know you had your name down for that. I was really yes. keen to see that event. But where do you... What's your list? Have you got a list? Have you got oh, like, yes. oh, you've got a hit list. You got guys. Oh, yes. Can you talk I've... to me about that? Is that, I know <laughs> that's not your style because you don't want to call people out necessarily. Of course. But... No, but yeah, I've got a, I've got a picture of everybody that I want on, on the inside of my garage door where I train in my garage. They're, they're all there. there there's a list of guys there. Um, and these guys, they, they appear that they, they stand taller in terms of who I'm more so hunting down um, at any given time. Um, you know, I, I like, I, I want to, I want to subdue some of the loud talking guys. I, I want to just show that, you know, a quiet guy relatively unknown can really emerge out of nowhere and uh, just say, boo. And I show them something mm. uh, that really excites me. Um so yeah, there, there, there are quite are most a of these few... guys North Americans or is it? Yeah, it's more so North Americans. Um, right. I, at this point, I don't really have much aspirations for traveling outside of the U.S. I'm just more comfortable in the U.S. I, I don't, I don't enjoy flying that much. It's not a big thing, but it's, it's something that I'm starting to get a little more acclimated with. Um, but as of right now, I, there, there's there's plenty of stuff. There, there's plenty of matches over here that I see that'll uh, level me up, um, and I, that's what I want to focus on. Um, so yeah, so there are a few guys, and I can be open about a few of them. You know, um, Justin Bishop is a guy who I wanted left-handed um, for a while. We've had that match set up a few times. It's fell, fallen apart a few times for mm. um, you know certain amount of reasons, but um, you know at nobody's fault at all. Um, but he's just somebody that I've seen, like, he has a lot of the spotlight. Um, and I just, it's an, it's a platform for me to really just say hello to the arm wrestling community. Like I'm here. Um, oh, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. He's, he's also a guy that's, I mean, he's actually a little lighter than me now. Um, but he's one of the guys that would be my weight class. I think it would be great. Um, He's made a comment online. That this is what really started me wanting to go after him. He made a comment a few years ago saying that his left hand is uh, 
he thinks is the best under 200 pounds in North America. Nobody can beat him. So at that point, before I even pulled Seth, you know, I was like, I'm a nobody. And I feel like if I was to show up and pull Justin Bishop, he'd be like, okay, maybe that I need to take back that statement. Um, so that's sort of, that, that's the way that I think in terms of wanting, wanting to go after somebody. I like those little things. You know, when he makes that kind, when he makes that comment online, it's like, I know who I want to shoot for now. Yeah, yeah. And he's not a loudmouth guy, though. He's not a loudmouth guy. He's no, just, he's a confident he's, guy. He's alpha. Right. And he's very confident. Which is excellent. I like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I like that. There's other loudmouth guys that, I don't want to call them out, but there's, you know, loudmouth guys, more trash talkers and stuff like that, that I just want to subdue them just for the sake of that. Like I said, it's completely different from my personality. There would be nothing better to shut somebody up that way. Are there guys in terms of, um, if you look at the North American picture right now, of which, <clears throat> let's be honest, there's a lot of very good arm wrestlers. There's a lot of very good arm wrestlers there that don't necessarily get the, uh, perhaps the recognition. But, but particularly around your weight class, there is no shortage of excellent arm wrestlers. Now, when you sort of break that down, you look at that crop of guys, who are the people that really stand out to you? Who are the people that you think to yourself, yeah, I'm at this level. Okay, this guy might be slightly above me. This guy might be slightly above me. This guy might be slightly above me. But this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, I can definitely knock off or I'm mm-hmm. right there. Does that, it sounds like you've got a little bit of a, a thing that's pissing you off. And, and now and again, it's not unheard of. But like right. you say, that situation to present itself where a guy shows up, guy that came on my radar the other week, Robbie Russell. Mm. Oh, yes. Where the oh, yes. Did Robbie Russell come from? And all of a sudden, oh, yes. bang, Robbie Russell's, you know, cracked Craig. Craig, very established. Robbie, not as established. Robbie's on the rise. And so, Robbie did it in a way that is unbelievable. Craig well, fouled also out. Cracked Jerome, didn't he? The same yeah. day. Yes, a yes. you all loud. So yes. But Craig Robbie was they pulling strong that day. Craig fouled out, and Robbie was like, "I don't want that. I want to beat you." And he beat him like that. That's a statement. Yes, it is. That's a statement. Hmm. But. You want a clock back a month, and you'd have said, you know, Robbie Russell to a lot of guys, it, me included. I knew of Robbie, but not knew of Robbie. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You'd have said Robbie Russell. I'd have thought, yeah, Robbie's oh, he's all right. He's up and coming. I've seen him. I've seen him knock. He's all right. But I wouldn't have thought he's about to crack Craig next week. Mm. You're right. Now, it's one result, but God damn, Robbie Russell's on my radar. <laughs> yeah. Because... Exact same scenario that Paul Lynn got on my radar at the Arnold's one day. I'm walking around there, went over from what I was working on, walked past the arm wrestling stage. I arrived just as Paul Lynn's in a screamer with Craig. And I didn't really know of Paul Lynn, but I did when I left. Right. That's right. So that's yeah. the thing, isn't it? And that and that's who I wanted to sort of... Who were the guys? Who were the guys? You know, without necessarily... Yes. Giving anybody any aggravation? Who are the guys that you think I'm there? This this guy's good. We got Bishop left. Storm. Some... Storm. I can love that one because that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. I've been I, I've been asking and poking Storm a little bit, you know, in the last few years. And stuff hasn't worked out. Um, mm. But there's also a part of me that the longer you wait, the better it is for me because I know I'm climbing. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I can I can be patient. I can be patient. That's a you're not shy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's two big names right there, mate. <clears throat> two yeah. big names. Yeah, if yeah. you go left and right on those two, that's that's big. And is that again a lefty or is that right or lefty? Not. I would go both. Both. Both arms. Yeah. Yep. How do you rate the current crop of? If I throw a few names at you. Do you believe these guys are head and shoulders up? Okay, so let's start with, we'll, we'll leave Paul, because I think you've said a lot about Paul. Oh, yeah. Rob Vigeon. I mean, come on. He's the best. Yeah, you've got him as the best, okay? Yes. But I, want, but I want Rob's left. Well, you want, he's another one. <laughs> I want Rob's left. 
I want his left. left arm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. I, I was closer to that, and I need payback for my right arm injury. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. What about Mosier? Yeah, so I've thought about Mosier a bunch. Um, there are definitely lanes to stop him. I definitely do believe he's by far ahead of me. Um, I think if, if I were to get a stop on Dan, then I'd be confident in overcoming and becoming ses- successful on, on that match. So um, I definitely rate Dan much higher than me, and I think he's by far the favorite, um, right-handed for sure. Okay, I'm going to move um, across a little bit, and we're going to a different area to try and gauge. We've named a couple of really big names there. The other one I would have thrown in would have been Herman Stevens, who, who I rate right up there as well. But oh, he's yeah. a little bigger. You yes. Know, let's be honest. Got a bit, got a bit, a bit of a bit of a tub going while he's <laughs> trying, to, trying to build his house again. Love you, Herman. Oh yeah, but, Herman's um, awesome. Let's come down to a guy that I think has great potential in Kevin Robertson. I've never pulled Kevin. Because <clears throat> I like that match. I'm not gonna I lie. do too. I do too. I think that would be a great match. Um, you know, he's definitely one of those guys at that level in terms of up and comers. And, uh, I mean, he's been there for a while. He's one that when I was in, uh, Chicago, I think WL 2017 for one of the Chicago events, um, like I would look up to, look up to him at the table and be like, Jesus Christ, this guy's a beast. Mm. Yeah, he's, so, got yeah. A, he's got a frame, honey. He's a big dude. He is a <laughs> big is, dude. He? He's got a frame. When I was at WL for the first time, I thought, yeah, he's got a frame on him. He's got yeah. that sort of Jordan Sill, Sonny Larson thing going where you think, yeah, the the man is not necessarily the potential of that frame. Yep, for sure. So, yeah, that that would be a great, great right-handed match. Uh, left, I would be confident in uh, a victory on him, but right, I think, is a great match. Well, I've got Kevin on the show tomorrow, so I'll be bringing my fucking paraffin to pour on that particular bonfire. There you go. <laughs> now, if we look at slightly outside of that, other people who I think you match up with quite well, talk to me about Nicholas Nanastad. What do you know about him, the steel oh, giraffe? I mean, I know plenty about him. I have that see that that's something that I don't think I've ever come across somebody that tall. Um, so I really have no idea how how I would match up against that. That that is just a completely different animal. I've never mm. come across that. Um, solid left, solid yeah, right, for sure. Favorite on his left, for sure. Puller on the top roll. I quite like that. That's a chess match for me. Mm. Yeah, that that definitely could be. And like I said, for me, that would that would really keep me on my toes because I I really don't even know how to guess. I really don't know how to guess where that would go. How mm. how close or how far away that match would be? I have no idea. That's a big question mark for me, and that would keep me on my toes. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. It's one I've thought about for a while. What about Dallas Langston? Yeah, he's 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 a he's a definitely one that has shown quite a bit lately. Um, I mean, I'm confident I could take that hand for sure. There's no question about it that that hand would get knocked back. Um, whether I'd be able to pull through that is is obviously the question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. I think by the perception of the uh, majority of the guys in the U.S., I would be the slight underdog. Um, but I think the guys that know me, I think I would be the slight favorite. Um, I think I could go through that um, and be able to pull through any of his side pressure with his wrist cocked back. Yeah, I remember Paul Lynn told me the same thing. He had you as a favorite on that. Yeah. Again, stylistically very, very interesting matchup. Yes. Yep, for sure. What about Bill Logston? Bill Logston, yeah, that's another one. I mean, he's he's kind of perked up in weight, you know, closer to this 190-ish and, and up there. I know he's been a, a little lighter in the past, and, you know, he's kind of fluctuated from there. Um, yeah, the hand of steel, as he's known. I want to feel that. Mm-hmm. I, w- I want to see what, what he thinks is the hand of steel. Um, yeah, th- I, that would be great. That would be a good one. I think that would be a really good match. Um, I think he's probably around my height, maybe six foot five, five eleven, somewhere there. I'm not 100 percent sure, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I, I want to feel somebody that has a nick- nickname Hand of Steel. And one more for you, 
Quinla Mendes. Right. That I think that would be a really good match. Um and I think that would be one that I think people would uh open their eyes to. Um because I think I'd be confident in a victory both right and left. Um but I don't think it would be any type of sweep. Um I think he would get into his zone, I would get into my zone. Uh mm-hmm. be a little bit back and forth, but I think that is a really good one for me to uh set the stage, so to say, and to say, you know, I'm here, I belong in this class, I belong at this level. Um yeah, I I I would definitely want to match with Quinlan to uh to make a stance. Jason, we're an hour into the show, and I know you're limited on time, mate. You've got things to do, but uh, I have really, really enjoyed this. I found it very entertaining, very engaging, and I'm sure that the people watching the show have as well, and they learned a little bit about you. It won't be the last time we're on here. This is part one. We'll definitely pick up uh, on another part, mate. And I'd like to get some comments from people. Please email your comments, email any questions you want us to put to this gent. Uh, remember, you can send it over to the channel. That's supernaturalstrengthchannel at gmail.com. Nice and easy, supernatural strength channel at gmail.com. Put the questions in the comments. This guy's active in comments. He'll probably be reading them and we'll oh, pick yeah. them up the next time we get Jason on the show. Jason, thanks so much, mate, for coming on. Neil, yeah, really, it was an absolute uh, pleasure. pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. And for those of you out there, if this is your first stop by Supernatural Strength, please like, share, and subscribe. Let everybody know about it and we will be back on here very, very soon. Uh, Jay, this is probably going to come out the next couple of days. So I'm sure I'll be in touch with you again soon. And also, I'm putting, um, as I say, shows together with a, a number of the people who I consider new blood. Excellent. I think it's Kevin great. Kevin coming on here tomorrow. Uh, there's another couple lined up as well. So what I want to do after that is maybe get you on together and whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> it can make things kick a little bit, you know. Oh, so yeah. that, that's, the, that's the plan. Ladies and gents. This has been Jason Merlo, part one. We'll be back on with this guy again soon. Until we see you next time, take it easy, peeps. What grabs your eyes on that, if anything?